welcome to Interludes with Chris McKenzie. And it's with very great pleasure and a lot of fun and a lot of laughs that I welcome back Louis Fyander. And it's not often one can say that an actor is of stage, screen and television, and I would like to add also a man of many parts. Welcome back to Golden Some of them no longer manufactured. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. It's lovely to be back. I must be doing something right. Oh, (laughs) absolutely. 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 The last time we we talked, uh, we decided that we were sort of not quite done with England and Europe, but that... I wanted to hear more about your coming back to Australia and why you came back and what you dived into and did. So just keep talking and tell me. Well, this comes into a pretty difficult sort of situation because it's a a personal thing. But nowadays, as everyone's, you know, become a star, it seems that you you tell everybody in the world um, who you're in bed with. And (laughs) uh, that's not grammatically correct, but... uh, um, you know, it's like watching all the people avidly reading the the nasty little stories of people in those magazines yes. as you go out of the yeah. Um, yeah. the supermarket checkout. Yeah. You know, unless yeah. he's voraciously reading this yes. about who's doing what and God knows what. And uh, that seems to be the um, the criteria for being a star nowadays, rather okay. than for your yep the quality of your work. But when I was out here with uh, Rex Harrison and Claudia Colbert. Um, all right, I'll tell it. Um, my my wife, we covered this once, but my, my wife uh, pulled the plugs on marriage, mm-hmm. which was a big surprise to myself and to our son. And it was pretty hurtful. So uh, after the tour of um, uh, Aren't We All, I went back to London and uh, nothing could be resolved. And I was concerned about what was going to happen to our son and she wasn't uh, uh, very keen to come to any conclusions. Mm-hmm. And then I was walking past the phone one day in my London place, and it was Sue Natras uh, from the Art Centre who said, if you were offered it, would you uh, be interested in playing Professor Higgins in My Fair Lady? <laughs> so I just said, oh, yes, and slammed the phone down, you see. And about a week later, uh, back to said, right, it's on. Well, that made things even worse, particularly with regard to young Adam. And uh, so... I I spoke to my wife about it and said, trying to push the issue, uh, what should happen to him, whether he should go to a boarding school, poor kid, or Mm. whatever. And uh, I said, I've been asked to go to Australia and I would like to take him with me. And to my absolute horror, she said, yes, it's fine. Uh, Made things even worse, because truthfully, we we adored her. Mm. I adored her and my son adored her. And uh, and so we we got on the plane to come to... um, Australia uh, to do that and uh, I thought that I had the responsibility of bringing Adam up yep. in Australia where he was born when yep. we were out here in 1976 yep. with same time next year play at the comedy theatre um, it's a bit difficult to explain it I'm hesitating and probably getting a little bit boring but uh, so I had the responsibility of playing Higgins coming back home and uh, bringing him up, up my son at the same time yep. Um my Fair Lady was probably one of the... This particular production was probably one of the biggest in the world. Even the Germans, I don't think, mounted a production really? of it. It was so big. And it was planned to show off uh, the resources of the state theatre. Uh-huh. So the sets were vast. They came in from the sides and down from the back, showing the size of the stage. You know, the only thing mm-hmm. they didn't do was come from the ceiling. Yeah. Um, chandeliers came down from the ceiling. And it had a lovely cast in Warren Mitchell, uh, uh, yes. who was playing Doolittle, and uh, Darling Madge Ryan, who was uh, Pearl in the summer of the 17th Doll, all those many years ago, and uh, June Bubbles Bronhill uh-huh. playing uh, uh, Mrs. Pierce, and Noel Ferrier playing Colonel Pickering. Oh, right. Um, the young lady playing my Eliza um, was a nice lady, but... We didn't get on very well together, but <laughs> particularly uh, to tell the truth, it's a fact, she was one uh, one week late for rehearsals. So that did cause um, a lot of problems. But it was a popular show, I bet. Oh, yes, it was sold out. Uh, we played here about eight weeks, I think, yes. and then it moved on to Sydney. But at that point, I was just um, really pretty tense with... Yep. relationships back in London yep. and with my son and so also you, so with a leading lady that I didn't get on with so, so you I, I didn't just go to withdrew Sydney. no no no, no. 
I was asked to come to do the Melbourne season, and I think I did my job. And, yeah. Um, I wasn't bad in it, I think, but not as good as Rex. But oh, who is? Well, well, there you are. <laughs> I mean, you know, he really made it his own, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, everybody else has their own and uh, uh, their own. Well, he's a master style. of light comedy, and having worked yeah. with him the year before uh, was a great advantage. You know, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, did you did you stay in Melbourne and continue to do other other things then? Yes, I mean that was it. And then I think the next job I was offered here was uh, to tour the Browning version with uh, Paul Eddington. Oh, lovely man! From yes, yes, Prime Minister. Yes. And uh, that was very nice. But I'd learnt very quickly. And if there is a tinge of bitterness in what I say, um, well, it, it is so. Yep. Um, but coming back here and uh, sort of settling down, you have to sacrifice a hell of a lot. Yep. So I went very quickly from leading man to um, supporting man to an overseas star. Nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. but uh, that seemed to be we now put you where we think you should be. Yep. And yep. it was not nice. No. But, uh, uh, but at least it was work, wasn't it? Well, yes. I mean, but it, it yes, you're right. Mm. Um, someone told me, who you know, um, that if I stayed in Australia, within six months I would become an $80 a week actor. Uh-oh. And uh, <laughs> to a certain degree, that's true. Yes, okay. So but you continued to stay and, and take other work? Yeah, yeah. I did a television series for the ABC, but um, and I behaved quite badly on it, I think, because I was having such trouble trying to bring up my kid yep. and protect him from, um, you know, the pain that he was going through. And um, also the fact that being a single dad... Mm. Um, it's not easy. Not easy. No. And when you're doing a television series where in Australia they don't do one episode every 10 days like they do in England, mm. you know, a rump hole of the Bailey or something like that. Oh, is that, is that what they do? Oh, yes. You've got plenty of time to live mm. where one was coming home, trying to cook for my son, yeah. trying to learn my lines. And I'm always a very slow study and get back in the studio anything from five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning through till eight or on a rare occasion to go in at nine o'clock. And they only did one episode a week in England. What did they do That's here? right. That's right. Well, I think we were doing two and a half. We were rehearsing one and doing another. And I can't remember. It was... it was Busy, busy. Oh. And uh, although, you know, we think we're pretty accomplished doing it, it doesn't help for standards. No. And uh, I don't know of too many shows that um, sold overseas, say, as the BBC yep. do. Um, when I did Pride and Prejudice many years ago, uh, that was... Uh, you know, plenty of time. You were able to enjoy each other's company, but dashing around behind the sets trying to say, can you come through the lines with me, you know. But we had a good team on it. I had the privilege of working with a lady that I adore called Genevieve Pico. Mm. I think she's one of the finest actresses um, in this state. And uh, um, oh, Peter Curtin and... Yep. Uh, uh, oh, the memories... I'm having a blonde moment, I think. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it was it was tough work, really tough mm. uh, about lawyers and so forth, you mm. know. So, oh dear, oh dear. Well, now listen, we're going to. I think we should listen to some music that'll chirp us up, hopefully. Billy Williams. Ah, yes, yes. Well, uh, one of the things about um, Australia, and particularly Victoria, is the history of, of the performing arts. Um, we've produced so many international stars. And uh, there are three that fascinate me. They were born in Melbourne, Billy Williams, Florrie Ford, yep. uh, who had as many hits in a day as I suppose the Beatles did. Things like, uh, come, come, come and make eyes at me down at the old bull and bush, da, 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 da. Yep. Oh, oh, well, Antonio, he's gone away, you know. We play, the, we play that on Golden Days Radio. Do you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, of course, there is uh, the one that was not a hit, but the First World War came along and it became um, very much a part of the scene then, which is a long way to Tipperary, oh, yeah, wow. it's a long way to go. And the other person is Albert Whelan, who was the first person ever to have a signature tune. He used to whistle, coming on, top hat, very dapper, very handsome, silk scarf and gloves. And as he whistled this tune as he came on, he took off his gloves and took off the thing and did a very sophisticated act. Because mm. um, Music Hall can be pretty rough, you yep. know, and fun, yep. of course. 
But uh, I came across Billy Williams and this number, which I like, it, it seemed to come out of the fact that Australia was dominated by America in dance crazes. Yep. There was Alexander's Ragtime Band, the Turkey Trot, the Huggy Bear or something. Yeah. So Billy Williams, very much with tongue-in-cheek, wrote this song called The Kangaroo Hop. The Kangaroo Hop, the latest and the greatest song from Australia. <laughs> Daisy, have you seen the latest dance that come along? Daisy, go and put your Sunday hat and jacket on. There's going to be some jollity. Come with me, happy bee, fill your heart with ecstasy. Daisy, it's the greatest thing creation's ever known. Take a little tip from me. Hold tight, count all right. When you do the H-O-P, hop, hop. Come and do the kangaroo hop, hop. That's the dance for me and you. Talk about your Alexander's band and all the lot. Grizzly bear and Texas Tommy and the turkey trot. Come on and hop, hop. Hear the music go and pop. You'll never, never want to stop. There's no other kind of dance at all. So come along, my honey. Make the others look small. Come and do the kangaroo. Come and do the kangaroo hop. <laughs> hop. Hop, come and do the kangaroo, hop, 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 that's the dance for me and you. Talk about your Alexander's band and all the lot. Grizzly bear and Texas Tommy and the turkey trot, come on and hop, hop. Hear the music go and pop, you'll never, never want to stop. There's no other kind of dance at all. So come along, my honey, make the others look small. Come and do the kangaroo, come and do the kangaroo, hop. <laughs> Bring off your tail. <laughs> Daisy, won't you let me whisper something in your ear? Daisy, there's a lot of things I want to tell you, dear. Just come and throw yourself about. Hear them shout, there's no doubt. Everybody's coming out. Daisy, if I saw those little bees up in the air, that would make my heart go pop. It's a scream, one long dream. When you do the H-O-P, Hop, hop, come and do the kangaroo hop, hop, that's the dance for me and you talk about your Alexander's band and all the lot. Grizzly bear and Texas Tommy and the turkey trot, come on and hop, hop, hear the music go and pop, you'll never, never want to stop. Why, there's no other kind of dance at all, so come along, my honey, make the others look small. Come and do the kangaroo. Come and do the kangaroo hop, <laughs> hop, hop. Come and do the kangaroo. <laughs> See poor old father hopping about with his wooden leg, <laughs> and mother hopping around the room, <laughs> and Mary with her bad corn. <laughs> bad corn. Why, there's no other kind of dance at all. Come and do the kangaroo. Come and do the kangaroo hop. <laughs> hop. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to know, Lewis, is did you ever dance the kangaroo no, hop? No, but I do sing it. Do you know anybody else? Who no, dances? no, I don't. I do sing it and I do do a sort of kangaroo hop with, you know, little paws up in front of you and bending your knees and things. <laughs> I mean, people are hysterical. Eh? I, I can it's imagine. great, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know why, why our footy teams have got all these American songs where they sing their, their, you know, like when the Saints come marching in. Why they don't dig into the music hall past? There's some terrific Australian absolutely. songs. Absolutely, yeah, know? wonderful. Yeah. The kangaroo hop, like, I don't think it ever ever became an absolute rage to dance the kangaroo hop. No, I don't think so. Not but like I think Charleston. I think the song could come back. Oh yes. yeah. Yeah. Well, we could maybe we could make an, a, a, a positive act and bring it back on yes, Golden Days yes, Radio. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now let's continue for a bit longer because we're not going to. We don't have endless time. And I see here written. We're talking. You were talking about not enjoying working with Richard Todd. What were you doing? Oh, yes. I did a play called A Woman in Black, which yeah. uh, I think has been on in London for about 16 years. It's chasing the mousetrap, you know. Um, it's a ghost story, and it's only two people in it, or actually two in a bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can tell you. The other person's the ghost. Oh, right. And, which is pretty frightening. Oh, and there's also a dog, but that's invisible. <laughs> 
Right. This dog came on the stage and I patted it and things. There was a woman in the front row of the Sydney Opera House said, oh, it's a Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> So it must have been acting it well. Now, Dickie Todd was, um, uh, Richard Todd was a great, great British star. Yeah. Rob Roy, Robin Hood, yeah. uh, The Damn Busters, A Man Called Peter and things like that. Yeah. And um, uh, he's, he's a great theatre man too. And we, we toured this and we became very good friends. Lovely. And, um, and I still get letters from him. But shortly after, he's had the most awful tragedy. I'm not sure we didn't mention this before, um, Sometime, but uh, his second, his youngest son committed suicide, oh, and uh, God knows why, because he was the most beautiful young man, mm. uh, lovely boy. Was that at was Cambridge for the first year, had a lovely girlfriend, and then just couldn't cope. And would have changed father's life. Uh, Richard uh, devastated, yep. absolutely devastated. And his letters that I have are, are just uh, oh, oh dear, oh dear, is he still working? Richard, yes, mm. yes, he is. Uh, he's he's not too well at the moment, I don't think. Mm. But um, he just could not uh, get over this. And you must remember that Richard had a very tough war. Mm. He was a paratrooper, and he was the first one out of the plane on the D-Day landings. And, oh, good uh, grief! Yeah, N- not a, not a spot to be envied. No, no. <laughs> and when we uh, we were touring, we didn't come to Melbourne with it, which is surprising. But uh, when we were at the opera house, there were people standing outside the stage door waiting for him. And when he came out, people were saluting him and things and oh, saying, "Sir, marvelous. you know, and all that." I'm, I'm, what unit, you know, and such and such a unit. And I was at so and so Mons, or you know. How wonderful! Yeah, it was That's terrific. It would have been a terrific boost for him too. It, it was. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, it was a great boost acting with yeah, him. Yeah, I and, bet. Uh, it's really nice to have that sort of close relationship when you're doing a play it was yeah. extremely funny well, and I couldn't even maybe, tell you some could, of the could, stories could, could, couldn't you find someone to do it again <laughs> why not? not I'd love that <coughs> and a lot of people would like to do that but listen I think we're going we want to hear a little bit of um, June Bronhill don't we Cause oh she's yeah a, she's a great favourite of yours yes yes I love the name Bubbles Bronhill Bubbles yes well that, that comes from a production of Orpheus in the Underworld which was done at Sadler's Wells Theatre directed by my oldest friend in England a lady called Wendy Toy ah. Uh, who's directed everything except circus, I think, film mm. director, everything. But uh, there was a scene where um, Helen is supposed to be in the bath stark naked mm. and Zeus tries to get into a bathroom and he, he changes himself into a little uh, bee mm. and he comes through the keyhole. <laughs> and uh, Bronhill was naked in the bath, yes. we thought, but she had all these bubbles over her, these oh, lovely glass nice bubbles, then. yes. Uh, Right. <laughs> and so she was new. It was the most wonderfully funny production and a really <laughs> great Offenbach style to it. Oh, terrific. But Bronhill is one of the great voices, of course. Uh, we friendly. discussed the other ladies who yes. changed their names, like Melba and Ida Tasma, yeah. you know, and um, Florence Austral and Elsa Australia. Yes. Uh, June was June Goff and became June Broken Hill. That's right. Where she, she lived. So yep, it's June wonderful. Bronhill. So We're going to listen to her Here's singing. Bronnie doing something which I don't think you hear all that much. And it's a piece from uh, Mary England. But the, the, the power and the quality and the control in her diction is just wonderful. Right.
That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you for choosing it. It's terrific. Great, right, right, I yeah. think too many people forget, perhaps, about June Bronhill now because she's, you know, basically retired. And, yeah, yeah. Um, not in playing in any shows or anything like that. Yeah. And for that voice, should not be allowed to be forgotten. Yeah. Well, these are our great. Uh, this is our inheritance Isn't of uh, Australian great stars of uh, uh, the musical right. and yeah. uh, the music hall and opera. Yeah. It's a pity that the music hall, uh, Vogue, I guess you can call it that, ever disappeared. Yeah, but I it can always come back. Uh, I went up to um, Queensland recently and did one for a friend of mine. Yeah. And she was determined to put it in a music hall, so I did the chairman for her. And yes. it's great fun, and these old, old gags, just as we used at the beginning of the program. Yeah. Louis Van Der is a man of many parts, some of them no longer manufactured. You that's know, right. that's all the old music hall, the yeah. chairman stuff. You know. Yeah, I think, I think it's a lot of fun. And it's, um, it's a thing that so many people can enjoy. I mean... It, 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 there's no level. You can't say, well, you wouldn't enjoy it because you are too highbrow or too lowbrow no, no, or no. you don't understand no, this. You know, it's just fun to have a good time. And if you notice in the 21st century, we don't really have any funny songs anymore. No, we don't, do we? I mean, uh, the period of she had to go and lose it at the Astor. Yep. And uh, and her mother came too. Who was that? Jack Buchanan. Yeah, something like and that. And yeah. even in the... 50s and 60s, uh, get out of here with that boom, 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 and right. it's in the book and yes. things like that, which I used to know backwards and as children, the Danny Kay records, and they Absolutely. were funny. But there's not, uh, as you say, there's not a lot no. of f funny tunes no. or funny melodies written Perhaps at all. we don't laugh enough. I don't really. think we do. Interesting that they're starting laughing schools. I was reading about it in, in, <laughs> in India. <laughs> 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 Did you not know? Oh, no. What you do is you spread your lips like this, <laughs> a big grin, and you go, ha, 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 a little faster, ha, 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 ha. That's right, apparently. I mean, that, Isn't it it's incredible? Hysterical. And it's being tremendously <laughs> popular. I can't believe it. <laughs> well, just mention it. I'm laughing now. <laughs> well, listen, we're going to have to finish because we're running out of time, but uh, laughing and all, will you come back again? Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is running into a series, isn't we'll it? See, we'll see you again soon, I okay. hope. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> you have been listening to Interludes with Chris McKenzie.